So this is, this is, I think, both my preference and also my impression of uh, something that a lot of people want for the Ethereum protocol, which is basically for the des a desire that for Ethereum to kind of eventually settle down. Hey guys, welcome back to Library of Wealth. Co-founder of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, spoke about the long-term future of Ethereum during the annual ETHCC in Paris. Buterin says that the deep changes to the network will include updating its monetary policy, security model, and more during the next merge upgrade. He also states that Ethereum will transition from proof-of-work to proof-of-stake. Let's listen to Vitalik Buterin as he outlines the long and short-term changes to the Ethereum network. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. Completing the transition involves deep changes, right? It involves deep changes, and I don't just mean like deep changes that people who write code have to care about. I mean deep changes in how people think about the Ethereum protocol and uh, kind of conceive of uh, the uh, properties that the Ethereum protocol provides, people who interact with Ethereum. Uh, so monetary policy, right? So the switch from proof of work to proof of stake is going to decrease issuance from 5 million a year to this kind of weird math equation that's like 166 multiplied by the square root of the total deposits. So if there is a million ETH staking, it's 166,000. If there is 100 million ETH staking, it only goes up to 1.66 million. So in all cases, it decreases by a lot, right? It's not fixed anymore, but it's much lower than it used to be. Uh, so monetary policy is changing. Security model is uh, changing. So proof of stake is, it is much more secure than proof of work, but it does have its trade-offs. And this concept of weak subjectivity is uh, one of the big uh, trade-offs of uh, proof of stake. And um, you know, this is something that I've talked about a lot. This is something that we've talked about a lot. This is something that Ethereum researchers have already built a lot of tools around measuring, but it is a change to the security model. Data availability sampling. Uh, so this is the idea that you can literally have a blockchain run without needing even a single node to process the entire chain, which is something that like from a blockchain point of view is very fascinating and mind blowing. But from a kind of broader distributed systems point of view, it's like totally uh, uh, common sense, right? Like nobody would even consider building a version of BitTorrent where everyone has to download every movie. Right? But that's how blockchains work today. Uh, so trying to kind of combine the actual distribution uh, that, like, of, that you see in peer-to-peer -peer networks, where you actually have like, different parts of the network responsible for different parts of the data, with the uh, security properties that blockchains provide. Right? Like, this is basically what um, Ethereum is trying to go towards. And that does include some, change, some changes to the security model. Layer 2 history access. Uh, so a lot of dApps that are built on Ethereum uh, historically, they've relied on this assumption that you can use things like history access that, uh, and you can look at historical logs, you can look at historical transactions, and the dApp from like, you directly using the Web3 protocol would be able to just like, tell you the entire history of everything related to you that happened in the dApp. Right? And this is something that has been true for Ethereum's history, but it's something that's not going to be true anymore. And the reason why it's not going to be true anymore is because of uh, EIP 4444, right? Basically, with EIP 4444, moving, moving toward a world where ac um, this function of accessing and restoring and retrieving all of the entire history of Ethereum is not going to be a kind of core requirement of an Ethereum node anymore, right? And the reason why it has to be done is basically because uh, people value scalability. And if we want scalability, um, and uh, if you want decentralization, so like the ability to run nodes easily, then you just can't require nodes to store this kind of constant, ever-growing amount of space. Now, we, there are alternatives, right? So. There are plenty of like very secure, very decentralized ways to store the history that do not involve requiring every single Ethereum node to store the history. Um, so there's like second layer protocols, things like the graph. There's work that's being done by people in the portal network. There's uh, work um, 
that's uh, being done by some other groups. So, um, there's people trying to kind of upload uh, part Ethereum history to BitTorrent. There's uh, block explorers of which there's like a bunch and you can probably make a multiplexer that just like keeps on asking each one of them. I and mean, you can even make a protocol that like asks them for proofs to make it more secure. Um, so there's lots of alternative ways to access history, but that's not going to be like something that the Ethereum protocol itself is directly responsible for, right? Uh, so that's a change to also a change to the security model. Now it is a change that I think DApps have already mostly adapted to. Like if you use DApps today, most and they access history, most of them don't you are not going to use like the Web3 API directly. Lots of them already use the graph, right? So this is something that I think the ecosystem is already adapted to, but it is a change that is a kind of a necessary part of uh, Ethereum becoming more decentralized and more scalable. Um, new cryptography. Uh, so the Ethereum of 2015 relied only on um, Ketchak hashes and elliptic curve cryptography for security, right? Just those two ingredients. The Ethereum of uh, 2023 is going to rely on that plus more complex uses of elliptic curves with things like uh, with things like vertical trees, if they come in 2023, it could be 2024 as well. Um, it, um, also, elliptic curve pairings, uh, which is uh, a more complicated form of elliptic curve math, which the beacon chain already relies on. Um, some like universal trusted setup for data availability sampling, um, and you know potentially like some. Uh, eventually, the yeah, randomness is going to be augmented by VDF as well, right? So there's also like some new cryptographic assumptions that are being introduced. And these new cryptographic assumptions give us a lot of really massive benefits, right? So like the Ethereum of today that uses BLS signatures that rely on pairings, that allows us to have hundreds of thousands of validators, which allows us to have a, let people stake if they, directly with a minimum of 32 ETH. Does anyone remember what that minimum was before we decided to use BLS? It was 1,500, right? So we added a security assumption in, or a, uh, on a new cryptography, and the benefit is that staking became 50 times more accessible. Uh, so basically, there are very real benefits that are going on, but also like, real changes here. Um, the transaction inclusion process. Uh, so EIP-1559 happened last year. It was amazing. It changed a lot. But it also changed a lot about how we have to think about including transactions. Account abstraction, uh, basically people being able to send transactions that are verified not just by elliptic curve signatures, but by like whatever kind of uh, algorithm they want. So, like, so you could have better multi-sigs, better smart contract wallets, better social recovery wallets, move to other algorithms. Um, potentially, um, with account abstraction, you could also have signatures that are much smaller. You can use uh, signature aggregation. And this is really powerful in rollups because, uh, so the, the yeah, ERC-4337 team, this is the team that's uh, work, the, working on the yeah, account abstraction of ERC right now, They're, they've been starting to do this. And with a signature aggregation, you'll basically be able to remove the yeah, 65 bytes from every transaction that are the signature and replace it with just 65 bytes for an entire block, right? Um, so potentially rollups could become, could become three times cheaper if this is all implemented, right? So a lot of like uh, um, proposer builder separation could also change how um, transaction inclusion works, right? So there's a lot of things that are happening and a lot of things that have big and important benefits but that also require kind of changing how we think about certain things, right? Um, and it's also involved building a much stronger and a much more capable research and development ecosystem that's capable of coming up with these changes, testing them, making sure that, they're, that they do actually do what they need to do, implementing them, implementing them across five clients, making sure they're implemented the same way across five clients, making sure there's no bugs, and doing that entire pipeline and um, actually getting them to production. Right? So there's a lot of stuff happening, but, and um, this is where I get to kind of the more cautionary part of the talk, that doesn't mean that we should keep going this way forever. Buterin says that by the end of these updates, Ethereum will be a significantly more scalable system and will be able to process up to 100,000 transactions per second. Vitalik believes these new developments will be essential to the improvement of the ETH network. These new updates will require increased effort from developers, but their labors won't go unrewarded. 
What do you think of Buterin's improvements and plans for this next stage of Ethereum? Let us know in the comments below. Guys, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Library of Wealth. We'll see you in the next video.